Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Becca. Thank you so much for coming today. We are in lockdown again, which means that we can't have this event in person. So I can't see your faces or hear your voices. I can, however, see your questions and your live comments on YouTube and on Facebook. This is the place to ask questions and any questions that you may have throughout the event. Um, be that related to the specifics of COVID testing, faith, or anything else that you would like us to answer. There will be chances for question and answers um, twice throughout this. So if you ask your questions um, at the start now, uh, we will try and make sure to get to as many of those as we can. Now, if we were meeting face to face, I'd ask you how you are, how are you? But I can't do that. But I probably can guess the answer. From the many people that I've spoken to at the moment, no one is really okay, are they? 2020 has been a bit brutal. It's been a year of loneliness, sadness, and a year of loss for everyone across the country. A loss of jobs, a loss of stability, and a loss of normality. And for many, a loss of life, a loss of loved ones. 2020 has also been a year of questions, of confusion. Right back in March, we started asking them, didn't we? COVID, what's that all about? That won't come here, will it? It won't affect the UK. Uh, and quite quickly, it moved to, okay, so what is this? Am I at risk? Are my loved ones at risk? Why are the shelves empty? Where can I find toilet roll? Is my job safe? Am I safe? What do I do now in lockdown? When will normality return? And I am a Christian, which means I believe in a God who is all knowing, all good, and, and all loving. And I must be honest and say, I found myself many times asking the question that's perhaps most difficult. God, where are you in COVID-19? And I don't know why you're here, although I am really glad you are. Maybe you're here because you want to know more of the ins and outs of COVID. Maybe you were dragged virtually, of course. Or maybe you're here because that question has been bothering you too. Whatever the reason, I hope that today you have some of your questions answered. And the great thing about social media is we have access to your questions all throughout the evening. Um, we will have two times question and answers, as I said, um, so I please would ask that you ask your questions out. Thank you so much for those who already have asked their questions. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing some of those answers. Now, to start off the evening, we're going to hear from Ben and Colin. They are both key individuals in Southampton's battle against COVID, and they're also really serious about how faith plays a key part in their day-to-day -day work. As they speak, please feel free to ask them any questions and I will direct it to them in a question and answer after the video. Thanks, Ben. Good evening, everyone. And um, it's really great to be here. My name's Ben and um, I'm a GP. I was born in Bristol, later studied in Southampton where I graduated as a doctor back in 2009. I'm also a Christian. I haven't been a Christian my whole life, but I'd always have called myself one as a regular churchgoer and someone who was also brought up in a Christian family as well. Um, during my career as a doctor, I've done various roles, having worked in the hospital setting and then later on deciding to become a GP. And whilst being a GP, I've been involved in a mixture of both management and clinical work. And um, at the start of the pandemic, I was undertaking work as a locum GP and um, found that some of my usual work was, uh, was cancelled and it left me in a position where I was able to reflect on how I would uh, be using my time during the pandemic. I really wanted to help but I wasn't quite sure uh, of how that might look and where I might work and I guess there was um, an element of apprehension and anxiety as well as we were starting to really learn about the effects of COVID-19 for the first time. And um, I wrote to various places to, to offer uh, to work and was eventually asked to work for NHS 111 um, to take COVID calls, which I've now been doing since around about April time. And I guess uh, for me, this has been um, a really challenging job, but also hugely rewarding as well. Um, in particular, as we are constantly learning new things about COVID-19 and in the beginning we had very few uh, guidelines and very little information about the condition and it's fair to say that as time has progressed we now understand a lot more. For instance we recognise that a change in taste or smell is a very common presentation with COVID-19 
We've learnt about new uh, treatments such as things like dexamethasone, which are used in the hospital. And uh, we are trying to produce vaccines at both a scale and a pace that has never been seen before. And more recently, we've heard um, about this emerging long COVID, um, which um, many of you may have heard of and some of you might even have experienced or are experiencing for yourself at the moment. And um, a big part of my job has been trying to keep up to date with all this evidence and advice and being able to inform and help others. And it's fair to say that my work has taken me to new places and I've had to, to learn things very quickly and uh, work in ways that I would have thought I wouldn't have necessarily thought of before the pandemic. Um, for me, my faith as a Christian has really helped with that because um, I've been trying to take each day as it comes, trying to be willing to take on new challenges and learn new things, even if sometimes I felt uh, less prepared or even anxious at times. And there's this verse in the Bible in Matthew 6, 34, which says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And therefore, for me during this time, uh, my faith in Jesus has really helped because I believe that God has been leading me. I know that he has a plan and a purpose for my life. And it's this confidence and belief in Jesus as a Christian, which I believe has been helping me through. And um, I'm really grateful to be here this evening, really thankful for this time. And I really do hope that um, I'll be able to answer some of your questions this evening. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Colin Sons, and I am a associate professor at the University of Southampton. In terms of the work I do, I am a research scientist. And the focus of my team over the last few years has been developing this very simple, very cheap and easy to use test, which can be used to identify if you have a disease or an infection. So when the pandemic came along in January, February, and then we had a lockdown, uh, we thought to ourselves, why would we not use our knowledge, our skill sets, our time, our effort and the resources that we have at our own, uh, you know, that, that, that we have within the department to kind of see if we can develop a very simple test which would allow us to understand, allow us to pick people who have an infection because that would be fantastic for the government's track, trace and isolate program. And so we started on that journey. We were very confident. We knew it would be a very difficult task. So it was not just developing a test. It was also developing to a point where it would be really useful. And uh, we, and as I said earlier, the journey was very difficult. It had it had it had its ups and its downs. I was at times fairly dejected, anxious, uh, at points really thrilled, but again really disappointed. And to kind of explain what we were doing and what we were trying to achieve, the idea, I, I would probably draw an analogy. Uh, so we knew that in terms of technology, we had a steam engine. And I was asking the steam engine to, to kind of travel at the speed of light. So I knew that the technology had, had its limitations and it would be very difficult to achieve that. But I knew at some, within myself, that God is, is going to help me with this. As always, he's, he's been there with me, so he's going to help me with this as well. And he'll help me unravel his mysteries uh, through the scientific, you know, the trial and errors that we are doing. And so we continued, we continued, we persevered, and we have made the breakthrough. I knew that God has his own time. His, his timing is different than mine. And, uh, uh, and, and, and to, kind of, to kind of sum it up, where was God in COVID-19? I knew I had been praying really hard and the church has been praying really hard for me. So I knew that he's always there with me, sat next to me, thinking through those problems in the lab with, with the people doing the work. And I, I, and I knew that he's, he's the unchanging one. He is there with me and will be there with me. And his love was there for me and his love, and he loves me and he'll continue to love me. And that was a great encouragement. I look back and I, I and I see how things have panned through over the last last uh, last six months. And I knew that though I was dejected, though I was disappointed, that faith was there. And I knew that God would be there for me and he would turn up as he's always turned up for me. So I hope that uh, this is some sort of an encouragement for you all as well. And I knew that things have been difficult for 
everyone in the pandemic. But I, but I think it's worth remembering and worth looking back of how he's always been very kind and very graceful and very loving and has always turned up for you. So why would you not, not love such a God? Thank you so much, Ben and Colin. That was really helpful. Um, now, thank you already for all the questions that have been coming in. Um, if you are watching on uh, YouTube or if you're watching on Facebook and live streaming, if you just comment on the bottom of those comments, the magic of technology means that we can see your questions um, and we can get them answered. So please make sure you're commenting and um, leaving your questions. That'd be fantastic. Now, we already have a few questions that need answering. Um, so we're now going to go for a time with question and answer um, with Ben and Colin. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Colin, nice to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi, Becca. Um, OK, so first question. Um, what are the biggest risks of COVID-19 and why is it really so dangerous? Well, I'll, I'll, I, I can answer that one. Um, so, so I guess that the important message here is that um, the vast majority of people that get coronavirus will have either mild or moderate symptoms and will make a recovery. And I think that's a really important message. Um, the, 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 and we're also learning a huge uh, amount about coronavirus every single day. But what we do know is like with any illness, any uh, virus, that there will be certain people within the population that will be more susceptible. So there might be people with um, lower immune systems, they might be people with um, comorbidities, other medical conditions. So, um, so uh, as, as you get older, you, you may be more at risk of coronavirus because of that immune response, but also um, there are certain conditions such as heart disease, diabetes that make you more susceptible. But the real, uh, the most common presentation we're seeing in a hospital is a presentation of severe uh, pneumonia um, and, and, uh, and, you know, in some cases, I say not the majority, but in, in some cases that can progress to, to, to mechanical ventilation. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, <clears throat> so why can't you, so moving on from COVID, moving on to kind of testing, why can't you have a COVID test with no symptoms? Or why is it, so the question says, I think it's like, why has it been so So if there's only, can it, can it not pick up, does it have to have a certain amount of COVID to pick up, up with the testing? Well, I guess it's trying to suggest that if there is a very small amount of the virus, whether you are able to pick that up with your test. I mm -hmm. think the RT-PCR test, which is done in these centralized labs by the government and by everyone around the world, which is meant to be the gold standard, it yeah. definitely picks up even a very small, f it actually picks up the RNA and amplifies the RNA of the virus to a certain level, and then back calculates from that as to how much the virus is in that, mil in that one mil of your nasal swab. So it is very sensitive. Oh, wow. Okay, that's really interesting. That's very fab. Thank you very much. Um, Next one. Is it true children can't get COVID-19? Um, that's not true at all. I mean, it's fair to say that um, what we are seeing is in children, they tend to have mild, uh, much milder symptoms. And actually, some children have no symptoms at all. Um, but it's not true to say that, that, that children can't get coronavirus. OK, fab. Thank you. Um, so there's been talk about vaccine um, coming at the end of the year. Uh, is a vaccine that has been um, developed this quickly um, likely to actually be successful at uh, stopping us getting the virus? Ben, do you want to go or do I go? I think um, that'd be a, possibly a good one for you. I mean, my, my understanding uh, about the, the vaccines is whilst um, obviously the, they've been developed at a scale and pace that we've never seen before, um, there's still some really robust processes around that. And actually, uh, there, you know, many people have been um, tested and some of the, the bureaucracy around that is, is speeding up. But actually, um, regarding safety, um, I, I would be you know, very reassured that the, the processes are, are in place and that the, um, the trials are, are being done in the correct, the correct way. Colin, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, as you said, the efficacy data is the data which everyone looks at to see whether the vaccine is effective. And for the two vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine and the, and the, and the, uh, the other one, the Moderna vaccine, both of them, the efficacy data is, the complete data is yet to be published, but it looks pretty effective because they're saying they're able to stop back, uh, stop COVID in people, 95% of the people or 90% of the people. So, and rest assured, the FDA, which is the approval that they're seeking for, is pretty stringent. So if you go through an FDA, if you get through and get an FDA approval, that vaccine is definitely, you want to get it. 
yeah, you really want to have that vaccine, yeah. And one of the things I think that to say about the vaccines is both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines um, are using uh, new methodologies, so RNA, so this is um, looking at DNA sequencing, but they're working in very uh, similar ways. And what's, um, I think, really promising is that these vaccines have been trialled in different population groups, very large populations, and they're showing similar findings. So I think that's giving us, um, I know the, the, the results are very new, but that gives us a lot of confidence that it's more than likely that we're going to have an effective vaccine i think if you look uh, if you hear what the the deputy chief medical officer said we have two we have scored two penalties so i guess it's pretty impressive yeah mm. that's and he was I'm... relating to and he was relating to the two vaccines just to be you know clear Oh, that's really that's really helpful. I know there's been a lot of um, sort of fear, I think, around the vaccine that's been developed so quickly. So to know it's been quite so stringently approved is really reassuring. Thank you so much. Um, OK, another question. What are so the question says, um, when do you think there's a chance things might return to something like normality? <laughs> Well, I, I think that's the million dollar dollar question. Um, and I think the honest answer is we don't know. Um, some people are saying um, that, you know, by early spring, mid mid next year, perhaps uh, that there, there might be a sense of normalities. Others are saying we won't truly know until next winter um, because, you know, the winter months tends to be, you know, when more people have coughs and colds and, and, and typically that's when the flu season progresses. So, and of course it depends a huge amount of the logistics of, of manufacturing and getting a vaccination from production to uh, to the individual itself. Yeah, I would very much say that when is the logistical challenge. I think the efficacy data is there, it would get approval, but then it is jabbing everyone at the same time and kind of the whole population of the, of, of, the, of a country. That is a huge challenge. Mm. So, yeah. so, so there, there are thoughts that it will be, as Ben said, next spring or probably some, some people are saying uh, towards next Christmas, which I don't want to wait that long, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, but normality is in sight. That's really great. Thank yes. you. Um, okay, so we've got another uh, question coming in here from uh, Winston. Are the side of the are the side effects of the vaccine known yet? So are the side effects of the vaccine known? So I, I, I actually, it's, I don't know the data specifically, you know, how many adverse effects and things and what the, the nature of them are. Um, I don't know if Colin, you, you know any more about that, the specifics? No, nothing has been published yet. And if if there were any side effects, then they would have been published. They would have been in the open domain for people to look at and to people to read. So because they haven't published, it's the first set of results that they published. So you have to wait. The, uh, for the Moderna vaccine, people are meant to get uh, people meant to feel tired and you know a headache or something like that. But that is what that kind of proves that the vaccine is working. So mm. those are very very minor things that okay, you would I mean, even get. You know, yeah. Yeah, nothing to be worried about. That's no, great. no, no. That's really helpful. Um, okay, so does the COVID test work if you have small amounts of the virus? I think I answered that earlier. It does. So the current test, which is being used by the government, it does. It's very sensitive in technical in the technical terms and very specific. So yeah. it will pick that you have COVID and nothing else. There are other coronaviruses in circulation, and it will find out whether you have you have the SARS-CoV-2 or the other coronaviruses. So it's very specific and also very sensitive. I think I, would, I think it's the order of one to ten particles of the virus per mil of the sample, which is very specific, very sensitive. And so can, can, I, can I? Sorry. Can I can I come in on that as well? Because I mean, um, uh, you know, one of the things we 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 established with um, this, obviously. Um, how the test is actually performed will presumably have a, an effect on the accuracy. And we know um, it, initially when people had symptoms, we were advising that they should have a test done within the first five days because that's when it was most accurate. And more lately, the government extended that to um, the test being done within the first eight days. So presumably the longer you you, you leave it, you, there's, a, there's a higher probability you might get a, a sort of false negative result. Is that is that so correct? Can you so the so the viral load decreases, Ben. So as the viral load, that means the amount of virus that you carry decreases as you as you improve, isn't it? As the body tends to fight. So as you, but because the test, the way it works, not my test, the test which is which is which is thought as the gold standard, the way it works, it'll amplify. As I said, even if it finds an RNA, it'll keep on amplifying, and then after a certain set of amplification, it'll know that this is the amount of the initial initial RNA. So. Even after you improve and if you if you're all fine, there are chances that it'll still pick some RNA, and then say, oh, oh, 
but 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 that infectious load is very low so you would not infect others I understand. Amazing. Thank you so much. And um, Colin, can you tell us a little bit more about your your testing and your your type of testing? What would you hope um, uh, for that to look like? Across, would you like that something to be rolled across the country, or can you tell us a bit more about that? Oh, thank you. So the 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 problem that we faced when we started this, or I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, is that the the test that they were using, which is the test I was talking about, it would take several days before you would get an answer. Mm -hmm. And so, if you are able to if you want to control this pandemic, you want to find those people who are infecting others. So you want to find them and you want to isolate them. So you want to really have a test which is A, very cheap, but again, very accurate, but also something which gives you an answer within 10 to 15 minutes. And something, you know, if you want to really start the country going as, as it was before, you know, you want to get a test before you want to go and watch your football match or you want to go and get, get a test before you go into the cinema so that you don't start infecting. So you want a test which is rapid, which can be done by the side of the patient, a point of care or a point of testing test, if you see what I mean. So that yeah. is what our test is. It's very similar to the commonly known pregnancy test. It's called a rapid test and it would detect the virus within about 10 to 15 minutes. Wow. Amazing. And it would and be, so the, uh, and we are hoping that it will be several, several dollars, yeah, a few amazing. dollars, a couple of dollars, yeah. And and I guess event exactly as you say, so you could take that before you went somewhere just to make sure that you, you know, that's amazing, isn't it? That really would help us. Um, before oh, you go and drop your son to school, whatever, or before they go to school, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, um, are there any new treatments with COVID? Are, are we now better as a country at treating COVID um, than we were uh, at the beginning of the pandemic? And what does that look like? Yeah, um, I mean, almost certainly is the answer to that question. I mean, right at the beginning, we knew very little about this uh, virus, absolutely nothing, actually. And we've, we've had to, to learn more um, as time has gone on. So we've seen how um, dexamethasone, which is a, a steroid that's been around for a long time, is now being used in the hospital. Um, we learned very early on, actually, that in some cases, coronavirus can increase your risk to uh, what we call VTEs, which are blood clots. And um, my understanding is in the hospital setting, they now um, use blood thinners, anticoagulants uh, on a more regular basis as well. And actually, um, the the rate of mortality has uh, gone down. And actually, with the work that I'm doing in the community, what we've um, also seen is that we're identifying the symptoms that you would commonly see with coronavirus much sooner. So potentially, people are now presenting into hospital earlier on in the illness as well, um, when they can be uh, treated earlier and then have, um, you know, uh, more positive outcomes. Fantastic. That's great. Um, another question that we've got through is, do you need to wait until the virus gets into your system before you can get an accurate test? I um, probably don't understand the question, but of course you would need to wait for the virus to get into your system because there's no point otherwise testing. Um, I think probably, so you know, uh, so for the moment of infection um, and symptoms potentially, I don't know how long takes actually that might be a good question um ben how long uh, symptoms take to show um in that space where symptoms aren't showing but you are infected um are you able to at that point i know you said it's very sensitive but can you still have a test at that point yes this is called asymptomatic testing which is happening in southampton as you know people are giving the saliva so that they can be tested and that is called asymptomatic testing and a lot of people are infecting others when they are asymptomatic and the mm -hmm. problem with this uh, with this virus is is I think I, I read somewhere it's about 50% of the people are asymptomatic and Ben can correct me. So 50% of the people and these asymptomatic people seem to have a very high viral load. So they could be infecting a lot of people. And that is a problem with, with this pandemic, with, 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 with MERS and things like that. You would you'd show the symptoms and then start infecting others. So you could probably clamp the people down and, you know, you say, OK, you can, you can control the pandemic, but not in this case because yeah. you don't know who is infecting others. I think that's the real question. I mean, those who don't have symptoms, those are asymptomatic. It's very hard uh, to do large scale studies looking at how many of these people are actually infecting others. And actually, that's one of the questions which will, um, I guess, come to light when we start vaccinating people as well. Um, the vaccine might be effective, but can those people still transmit the virus to other people? And we just don't know that information yet. Um, but Becca, just regarding the other question, you know, how long does it take for the symptoms to present? It's probably somewhere between two and 14 uh, days. But that's why if you've been exposed, you know, if if, if someone in your house has suspected coronavirus, other household members should be isolating for 14 days. And that's why that sort of um, period of time exists. Perfect. Thank you so much. Right, we've got two, we've got um, time, I think, two more questions. 
Um, considering the flu vaccine is only 40 to 60 percent effective, do you know how um, the efficiency of the coronavirus vaccine can be so high? Why is that one so much higher than the flu vaccine? I guess it's a new technology, I suspect. Mm -hmm. uh, God's plan. I don't know. I don't know. 90 percent efficacy, 95 percent efficacy. That's huge because, you know, the. The CEO of Moderna was saying he was smiling between between the two years or whatever he said, you know, and it's because he was he wasn't sure as well that is this really true. So yeah. I guess, I mean, I don't know the, the, the data behind it, but um, just thinking about that, Colin, as well, I guess it would depend on uh, the population that's been vaccinated as well and their, you know, um, I guess the immune response that they have as well. But I think That'd you said, right, right yeah. they, 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 they had 30,000 and the other, other vaccine had 40,000 uh, volunteers so they had and as you said there was a there was a diverse there was a diversity within that within that cohort so it is pretty effective and the and the moderna one was also very effective against the older population that's what they mm -hmm. say the whole data would come up later but it's fantastic it's good for us god's there <laughs> that's what i think that's amazing no thank you that's really really encouraging um so we're gonna have one more uh, one last one now and then we will um do some more later um so is Gwen asks, is mass testing like what was used in Slovakia and trialed in Liverpool an economical, effective way forward? Well, it is. It is. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to, as we, as we said earlier, we're trying to screen out, you are trying to screen the population, find those people who are asymptomatic and people who are themselves not knowing that they're, they're infecting others. So, yes, it is it is very effective way of, of kind of controlling the infection. Excellent, thank you. And I guess if you can get it to the price that you're speaking about, it's economically a really good option as well, isn't it? Correct. Correct. So it's the time and the cost. And then, then if you add to that the numbers of the people you're screening, then of course it's going to be very effective. Absolutely. Oh, guys, thank you so much. And um, we will come back to you at the end of um, our event. Um, but for now, we're going to um, now hear um, from Clive Clive uh, Thorne. Uh, Clive is a pastor um, at uh, Southampton Lighthouse International Church, where many of us um, attend. Um, and uh, he's going to talk about loss in COVID and some of his experiences um, of, of that of that idea of loss. Um, we're then going to go to Nay Dawson, who's going to try and address that question. So where is God um, in COVID-19? Um, so over to Clive. My name is Clive Thorne. I'm one of the pastors of Southampton Lighthouse International Church. We've all been suffering to one degree or another during this COVID pandemic. As an extended family, we have actually lost one member to COVID and a couple of others have died of other things and we were unable to go to any of the funerals. Many have lost jobs, there's anxiety, loneliness. And in the midst of all of this, it's very common to be asked the question, where is God in COVID? Or indeed, to be asked, where is God when a loved one dies of other things, or disappointment, failure, being diagnosed with a, a, an incurable disease? There are many instances where we can be asking, where is God? And the honest truth is that often there are no easy answers, that many times it appears that God is silent, that no answer comes. Jesus himself had a friend called Lazarus and he heard from Lazarus's sisters that his friend was very sick but he stayed where he was a few days more and when he arrived at the house eventually Lazarus had been dead already for four days and the sisters asked him where were you you cured so many other people but when your friend was sick you weren't here Jesus wept with them when they asked him that question. Again, no great explanation, but really he was showing that God is with us in our suffering. Jesus himself cried out, why, when he was crucified? And again, there was no answer from heaven at that time. When he was baptized, God the Father had said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, but when he cried out from the cross, there was no answer from heaven. And very often when we're faced with life's really difficult questions, it seems like there is no answer. But what God promises us in the Bible is that he will be with us 
in the difficult times. There's a God of comfort, a God of peace, and he can be alongside us by his spirit as we turn to him. He doesn't promise us in the Bible that he will explain everything or that we will understand everything, but rather that he will be with us. And also that he can redeem every situation. At that graveside, at the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he die, he will go on living. And these weren't just words. He went on to raise Lazarus from the dead. And of course, after the cross, Jesus himself was raised to life once again. And although there may be no answer now, no understanding now to these difficult questions, there is a hope for the future in Jesus. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. No matter what happens, if we trust in him, even the dead will go on living. So the truth is, yes, there's no easy answers to what is happening now. But if we trust in God, there is comfort and there is hope. God bless you. Thanks so much, Clive. It's absolutely great to hear from you. Privileged to hear from Clive on the Isle of Wight. I wonder how you found this evening so far. It's been amazing, hasn't it? Listening to Ben and to Colin and to Clive. We'd love to hear from you now. So could you type in either to YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're watching, um, the answers to this question. So how has COVID impacted you personally? Just pop in the chat and then we can all see how has COVID impacted you? Because for all of us, it's had a massive impact, hasn't it, on different ways. We'd really be interested to find out from our audience tonight what it is that COVID has done and how it's impacted you. Um, so pop it into the chat and we'll see those coming through soon. Uh, for me, we're really impacted in the last two weeks. My kids are off school yet again. Uh, they've been sent home because there were two cases at school, 180 kids sent home. Wonder how it's impacted you. Anyone willing? We've got lots of people watching. I'd love to hear from you live. And are willing to send in how it's impacted you. There's many ways, aren't there, that it's impacted us, whether that's through loss of jobs, um, losing a family member, Thanks, Tasman. Whether that's work being busier than ever, there are so many different ways that COVID is, has impacted us personally and as society. Yeah, thank you, Andy. No socialising. I'm too much of an extrovert for that. I couldn't agree more. We'd love to hear from you. How has COVID impacted you? We're going to think a little bit more now about um, the big question that we're asking tonight. Where is God in COVID? And Clive shared a story from a book in the Bible called John. It's an eyewitness account written about the life of Jesus. The story was about Lazarus and his two sisters. And as Clive shared, um, Lazarus died. Jesus raised him from the dead. And in this passage, there are two sisters, two questions and two responses from Jesus that I want us to look at. Two of the questions that are asked in this little story in John's Gospel, John chapter 11, if you want to find it, are this. God, uh, Jesus, why didn't he do something and keep Lazarus from dying? And then secondly, Jesus, where were you? So the two questions, why didn't he do something and keep him from dying? And secondly, where were you? These questions are so applicable to our question tonight. God, why didn't you keep 1.33 million people from dying from COVID? God, where were you when my friend died in COVID and only four could attend her funeral? God, where were you when my friends and family lost their jobs and got thrown out of their houses because of their professions? So the questions that Mary and Martha are asking Jesus in this account of Lazarus' death and resurrection are completely applicable to us tonight. And we'd love to hear your questions. Um, we're going to have Sanjay join us in a bit. He's our other pastor at Lighthouse. So please pop in your questions now and the four of us will come back in. There's been highs and lows, haven't there, to lockdown. 
Some highs for us were buying fake turf, getting a huge paddling pool and playing for hours and hours in the summer with our kids. Some highs were Zoom calls with my children and getting to know their friends and just laughing lots. Maybe even having family quizzes or family get togethers across the UK in a way that we've never done before. But there were some lows, some all time lows that hopefully you'll have popped in the chat function. Uh, for me, as a 100% extrovert, it's been so difficult to be stuck in our house for so long. We're on our sixth week out of 10 this term where somebody from our family is isolating. I'm sure there's been highs and lows for you across this lockdown. But as we look at this story tonight, we see some really fascinating things about how Jesus responds to Lazarus' death. There are two emotional responses from Jesus. He weeps and he rages. Now the weeping of Jesus tells us who he is, but the rage of Jesus tells us what he came to do. What was it that made him so angry? If Jesus Christ knew that he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead to get him out of the grave, why was he weeping? Why was he really weeping? It says he began to weep when he saw everybody else weeping, but he knew he was going to turn their weeping into joy. If he's only thinking of Lazarus, that could not sustain the emotion, could it? So he couldn't only be thinking of them. And there's something really important here for us to see tonight. You see, Jesus is described as the God man. And because he's man and he loves these people, he sees the havoc of death from the inside and he feels it. He sees this devastation and there are tears. But because he's God, he's the God man, because he's God, he can look through this too. He's able to interrupt this funeral and turn it into joy. But he's looking throughout history and he's seeing all kinds of funerals that he will not interrupt. He's not gonna be able to show up at every funeral throughout history. And he doesn't just see Mary and Martha weeping, he sees everything. I wonder if you have ever wept at a coffin. If you haven't yet, if you've never wept despondently at a coffin, if you haven't wept like Mary and Martha wept at their coffin, you will. And Jesus and God have seen it. Someday either I will weep at my husband John's coffin or John will weep at mine. Do you know what we're gonna have to do? We're gonna have to get out a part of this story, verse 36, if you're looking at it on Bible Gateway, which says, they looked at him and they said, look at him weeping, this is Jesus, see how he loved them. So I realized when reading this story, he can't just be weeping about Lazarus, he can't just be weeping about Mary and Martha, knowing that he's going to do this miracle, which is to show forth his eventual defeat of death and show his glory and his goodness. Knowing that wouldn't sustain all that emotion and that weeping. You see what's happening here? He's thinking about us. He's thinking about you and he's thinking about me. So if I ever have to weep at John's coffin, I'll have to look at verse 36 and I'll have to read it not as behold how he loved Lazarus, but behold how he loves me, behold how he loves him. He's weeping because he sees us. Fortunately, because he loves us, he is not just weeping. I don't just need a God who weeps at the grave. I don't need a God who only weeps. I don't just need tears, but I don't need less than tears. I need more than tears. So Jesus weeps and Jesus rages, but what is he mad at in this story? There are two things that he's not mad at. He's not mad at them. He wouldn't be mad at them weeping, of course not. He's not mad at their grief and he's not mad at himself. He's mad at death 
And I think all of us here tonight will associate with that. He approaches death in a rage because he's about to do battle. He couldn't just be looking at Lazarus or he wouldn't be crying the way he is. He wouldn't be angry the way he is. He's looking at us. He's looking at you and me tonight. And he knows the only way he's going to interrupt any of our funerals is if he causes his own. And now he begins it. So in a sense, in this story, which I really invite you to read later on when this is finished, he's probably having a dialogue with death. Death says, you touch me and I'll touch you. You bring Lazarus out and I'll bury you. Jesus says, come on. He's bellowing with rage out of love, furious love. So where is God in a COVID world? As Clive said, we don't know the reason why God allows evil and suffering to continue, but we know the reason it isn't and what it can't be. The Bible says really clearly, this is not the way it should be. This is not the way it will be because God is love and love will win. When you look at the why question that we're trying to attempt tonight, in the face of relentless tragedies and injustices, I always come away feeling inadequate. And that's not going to be any different today. The question of suffering is a question that fills pages and pages of the Bible. It's almost the whole question that the Bible is about. And yet the Bible stops short of giving an ultimate answer why. Why evil and suffering? The Bible is clear that we live in a world of suffering and pain. It's clear that we live in a world of self-centeredness and darkness. But as to why, we just simply don't have a complete answer. And I think one of the reasons for the lack of a final explanation for evil is that one of the most fundamental and profound things that the Bible has to say about evil and suffering is that it should not be this way. You see, the problem with explaining evil is that you always end up excusing it or denying it. And to explain evil is to excuse it. It can't be that God doesn't care. God so loved us and hates suffering so much that he was willing to come down and get involved in it. And finally, as we conclude this bit of tonight, I just want to say that Jesus is stronger than death. Jesus raised Lazarus from the death. Jesus raised from the death himself. And it points to a day when anyone that believes in him, dying is merely going to sleep in Christ. In this um, story, it says in verse 25, you don't have to wait for the end. I am right now the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. And tonight we want to ask you some questions. You're asking us lots. We want to ask you some questions. Do you believe this? You see, Jesus offers us a hope of a new world, a world without pain or suffering, a world without tears or mourning, a world where death is beaten once and for all. But you don't have to wait for the end of time to know this resurrection power and life. By believing it today, we can begin to experience God's healing presence in our lives today. So can we find peace in a pandemic? Well, only Jesus can do that. And the question tonight is, will we trust him to do that? I'd like to hand over back to Becca as we come into a time of Q&A. It's been brilliant to speak with you tonight. We would really love to invite you to send in your questions and we'd really like you to consider whether tonight you could put your trust in him too. Thank you so much, Nay. Um, so we're going to move to our final question and answer session um, of the event tonight. Um, what I'd like to do is if you have any questions, whether they are related to COVID, um, something that Nay has spoken about or faith in general, um, if you could put them in the chat um, on Facebook or YouTube, that'd be fantastic and we can answer them. 
There's still uh, some questions that weren't asked earlier, uh, answered earlier, and there have been some that have come in before the event that we're going to answer. Um, but there is lots of time to get those questions answered. The great thing about this is um, nobody knows. Is it's one that we can write it, and um, it, it's a real opportunity to get that answered. So I'm going to invite our panel back. Um, we have Nay, John, and uh, sorry, Nay, Ben, and Colin, um, and we also have Sanjay, who is another pastor at uh, Southampton Lighthouse International Church. So I'm going to ask them all to come join me um, for our question and answer session. Amazing! Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. Okay, so um, we've had a few questions that um, we. Uh, just want to finish from earlier and then we're going to move on to our other ones. Um, our first one, um, I'm going to direct towards uh, either Ben or Colin, um, which says, how much protection does a PPE of a mask, a simple apron and gloves give healthcare workers face to face and hands on with COVID patients? So how much, how does PPE affect the COVID transmission? Ben? Well, I think I think it, you know it's about um, a combination of factors, isn't it? We know that the virus is most commonly spread as uh, in, in water droplet, um, or that it can be transmitted on surfaces as well. But more more than anything, it's the, the close uh, close contact with individuals and the uh, the water uh, the droplets. And particularly if you're in a close proximity and there's inadequate ventilation, then you're going to be more exposed. So um, we know that that protective gear is an important um, aspect of that. Obviously, there's different types of protection and and there's uh, emerging evidence all the time about its effectiveness. So I think the, the true answer is we don't know um, how much protection actually it does give, um, but it's got to be better than, than not having any protection at all. Uh, and it certainly does help for sure. Great, thank you, that's amazing, thanks. Um, so our next question, um, Nay, this one is directed at you. Um, in what ways has God given you peace in the middle of isolating six weeks out of 10? Thank you. And thanks, Susie. I guess that's you coming all the way from Dundee. Um, that's a very good question. You know, I'm a mum of two kids. I work 30 hours a week. My husband works 40 hours. It's been really stressful. Um, so on one level, people would be laughing at me saying, has they got any peace at all? But I think it's within the stress of life. Um, there's a peace, there's a peace knowing um, the one who is weightier and heavier than any of my problems and knowing that one I can go to him in whatever's happening so I wouldn't say that it's I'm this kind of calm serene duck <laughs> I'm more you know the the crazy legs underneath going as quick as I can to float down a river but I know the one who's weightier than any of my problems and I know the one who holds the universe and sustains the universe in his hands and so you know even today just real quick answer one of my daughters was really struggling. I asked some friends to pray and there's been a real peace in her character today. So there's lots of times God's done that. I wonder if we've got Becca. Oh, Becca might have gone. Shall I ask another question then? <laughs> oh, I, get, I get to choose the question, brilliant. Okay, we've got a great question from Rich. Uh, and I'm going to send this to the pastor in the group, which is Sanjay. Do you want to have a go? Yeah, so thanks, Rich. You're asking, what is it like running a church during a, a pandemic? Um, weird, in one word. Um, very strange. And none of us have led a, a church through a pandemic in this generation. Um, and so we're learning as we go. Um, and I guess, I guess the thing that we've been discovering is that in this time, there's a real need for hope. I mean, hope is at the, the heart of this. And I think everything they just shared um, is speaking of a God of hope who who looks to speak into our pain. I mean, for me, if I was to answer this question, where is God in the middle of COVID-19? I would answer by saying he's right there in the middle of it with us. Um, Jesus steps into the world and gives us this uh, picture of a God who's not distant, but close um, and actually much much more sort of mind-blowing than that that he would die himself I mean I've, I've thought a lot about that over these six seven eight months um, that Jesus is not a man unfamiliar with pain or suffering 
but one who very much understands it. And I guess as we, as a church, um, aim to address some of these issues or the, the questions around COVID, it's not to say that somehow we've got all the answers uh, or that it's easy or that we should just get on with it, but to realize that Jesus himself is with us in the pain. So we, we're trying to do that as a church, try to speak out of that hope that actually death is not the end and that there is life beyond any suffering that any of us are experiencing and God stands with us right in the middle of it. Um, I think some of the other things we've had to get very uh, acquainted with tech and, and getting um, stuff like this happening. So we've seen lots of benefits of church online um, and gathering lots of people um, from all over, not just the city, but all over the country and the world. So that's been great. And I think in some ways being able to build different kinds of relationships. And so we're eager to get back to live events and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we've also seen then as a, as, as a church, um, alongside the tech, amazing serving in the city, people meeting practical needs uh, for those who are struggling or isolating. I think in this season, at least in Southampton, the church has really um, been raised up to meet those those needs, to be the hands and feet of Jesus uh, in a, a city that's in need. So that's a little bit of what it's been like. Amazing. Thanks, Sanjay. So we've got some really brilliant questions coming in. I'm sure you loved hearing from Ben and Colin. Weren't they fantastic? So guys, I hope we haven't had this question asked already. Um, from Joanna, have we had a go at this one? No, okay, great. Ben, oh, we did, oh, we we did, we did. that one, okay. Well, fortunately our host is back now. Becca, do you want to take us on? Hello, sorry, I had to move back to the joys of life. Yes, so a question that was asked before the service um, was, um, let's start with the Sunday, you're talking about uh, the Christian God, why is that the only way? Okay, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so uh, why is Christianity, uh, why do we talk about that being the, the only way? Well, I would say it's, it's not so much about Christianity as a, a religion. Uh, what we've been talking a lot about tonight is about the person of Jesus. He is unique in history. Um, 2000 years ago, stepped into time and space and um, is unique not just because of, of what he said and what he did um, in his actions and in his words, but in particular, as Nay talked with us uh, about the, the cross, um, Jesus, the claim of the Bible is that Jesus died and he rose again. And if he did that, and everything, by the way, on Christianity hangs on that reality, um, and there's much evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. You know, after he was raised from the dead, um, it's claimed that, uh, 500 people saw him uh, all at one time or that the disciples could touch him and speak with him, um, that he appeared to all kinds of people and gave instructions to his uh, disciples. And so um, Jesus rising from the dead means that he died and rose again and that he beat death and he mm -hmm. beat, beat all of these things. And if that's true, then um, the unique claims of Jesus weren't just claims or words or good moral ideas or, or nice teachings. This is power defined in a person. And Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the father except through me. And um, that isn't an exclusive statement for the sake of rejecting all other religions and everything else in, in, in that sense. What, what he's saying is that real life is just in me. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't just do resurrection. He is the resurrection. And so when you think of it like that, Actually, Jesus is inviting us to a relationship with him. And um, and in terms of other faiths and beliefs, there's lots of good things in other uh, belief systems. But Jesus is unique in the fact that he offers this life and uh, life beyond death. And so that's why um, when we're talking about the Christian faith, um, it's important to focus particularly on Jesus and his claims to follow him personally um, as well. And that should then change us from the inside out not just doing good moral acts on the outside, but changes us from the inside out because he comes to live within us and makes us his own. So that's that's what I would say. Thank you. Great, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, okay, have I have missed it. Have we had Ruksha's question yet about trusting God? No. Okay, Nay, why don't we come to you with this one? Um, Ruksha asks, how do you trust in God when you see suffering around you? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. Thanks, Ruksha. Um, uh, such a big question, isn't it? So, I mean, there's suffering, isn't there? There's personal suffering. There's suffering we see on a global scale. There's natural suffering. Um, I think what I said in the talk was that 
knowing that we believe in a God who says that this is not the way it should be mm. and this is not the way it will be is really important because you know if your mindset or your religion says anything different about that then I would really struggle um, but God actually says he he's not happy with it it's not the way it should be and more than that he'll do something about it because he loves us mm. so I think I would be completely screwed if I didn't know God and lived in a world of suffering um, the suffering doesn't put me off the existence of God and I think even um, if there is no God then really you can't ask these questions of where does good and evil come from because there is no such thing as good and bad if there's no God. Um, and actually my, my husband's dad became a Christian when he went blind at the age of 18 mm -hmm. and he went from being an atheist to an angry atheist, mm -hmm. fair enough. And someone said to him, if you're an angry atheist, who are you angry at? And he just stopped and paused and realized he could no longer be angry at the God he didn't believe in. So um, yeah, thanks Roxy, great question. That is great, thank you. Um, I think Joanna's question wasn't answered earlier, which said, correct me if I'm wrong, is contracting the virus dependent on viral load of the host or the relative immunity of the recipient? Can a very small amount of the virus infect a person with a good immune system? So uh, can I go to uh, Ben or Colin for that one about contracting the virus? I'll just begin, Ben, one second before you, before you complete it. Yes, it does depend on the viral load because there's a threshold. I think that people have been... If you read literature now, there's a threshold. If you're above the threshold, you start infecting others. And so that is that is the viral load that, I, that you're talking about. I'm not sure about what happens with the, uh, what, what oh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the relative immunity, but Ben can kind of add on to that if he has any, any knowledge of that. Mm. There, okay. shouldn't, there shouldn't be, technically, there shouldn't be any immunity because this is something new, which none of us has seen. And that's what the whole concept of immunity is. Because if your immune system has never seen a bug like this, technically, in that sense, you don't have any immunity. Mm. So whether you have some immunity or no immunity, or that's a false concept. So, and that's the concept of a vaccine, yeah, to provide a, to provide immunity, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I've got nothing to add to that. I think um, that's great, Colin. Great, thanks, guys. That's so brilliant. Um, okay, so we've got time for a few more. Um, is it true? Um, that pain and suffering gets our attention about what life is about. Does God use it anyway? Uh, Sanjay, let's go to you for that question. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think in the West, actually, we've probably been really disoriented by COVID-19. Um, we just, you said at the beginning, Becca, you know, we, we don't think that it was going to touch us here. And what it's done is it's sent us into all this lockdown and isolation. And, um, you know, one writer, I think it was C.S. Lewis, he, he said that God whispers in our pleasures, but he shouts in our pain. Mm. And I think that's a really good way to think about it, that often pain and suffering, whether that's personal or global like this pandemic, is a way of God rousing our attention, getting getting our focus on him, on the bigger questions in life. I, I don't know why you've tuned in to this uh, session tonight, but, you know, it's a big question we're asking. Where is God? in all of this and I, I know about even for me as a Christian someone who leads a church I'm asking that question I'm asking about life and death and um, and so I think one thing that we we can all do when we're experiencing suffering and that the personal even the personal tragedies of life whatever they might be um, I think we would be wise to let that turn us to um, a greater curiosity about the world that we're living in a, a greater sense of humility that we aren't really in control as much as we'd like to think isn't it interesting this invisible tiny virus um, has brought us really to our knees um, that we need to recognize our vulnerability and when we think of it in that way um, I, I think God can use uh, these things that's not to say God caused the pandemic let me just be really clear here I, I'm not I'm not saying that um, but I think God can allow these things and the difficult things in our lives mm -hmm. to draw us nearer to him and so asking those questions are a brilliant place to start. And then I think once we travel down that road, what we discover, especially as Christians, we discover that God um, isn't as far away as he seems and that inside some of that suffering, and I'm sure you've each got your own story of this, but that God is very near and he has an answer for, for us. And, and I'm not sure if we've said this today, but 
one of the great truths of um, following Jesus and being being a Christian is that ultimately God has a plan to deal with all suffering and all injustice. The Bible speaks in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, of a place <coughs> where there is no more suffering, no more death. You know, Nay talked to us a little bit about the tears that Jesus wept. And it's true. And many of us weep tears of loss. But in, in the book of Revelation, it says that God himself will wipe away our tears. Isn't that amazing? Normally you wipe away your own tears. But imagine God, how kind and gentle he is to come and wipe your tears away. There will be no more mourning or death or pain or sickness or COVID-19. Uh, and that's really the biblical hope that we have into the future. And so um, I think pain is a, is a and suffering is a gateway to asking these bigger questions. Thank you. Amazing, Sanjay. Thanks. OK, so um, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, we've had a question which says, if I have contracted COVID already and recovered, how likely is it that you can contract it again? And can you affect others again? Um, ben or Colin, if one of you want to take that question. Well, I, I'll, I'll start, Colin, but I, I think, I mean, it's a really interesting um, question. I think from my understanding is that we've seen very few cases of people sort of emerging as uh, certainly across Europe as, as recontracting um, coronavirus, which does suggest that, you know, we do have a level of immunity. Our bodies obviously are developing um, antibodies. And certainly, Colin, the studies I've seen have suggested that the antibody levels, um, you know, uh, wean off with time, yeah. but there may be... Um, the immune system is far more complex. For instance, we've got memory T cells. So these, these are cells that remember how to fight infections. So it's a far more complicated um, than that. My understanding, Colin, is we don't, we don't know actually yet how long the immunity lasts. You're right, Ben, because it's, it's, it's only six months since we've known the virus. So for all these studies to happen, and then you, we would know over time whether we would be able, whether a vaccine will be able to protect us and so on and so forth. So whether the whether the body remembers what we have seen or whether it'll, it'll decay after a certain period of time. Yeah, so that's it's exactly what Ben has answered. So. But it's still too early. Sorry, that's the answer. It's still too early to conclude anything. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Amazing. Okay, so we're going to have one more question. Um, our last question today is... Um, so, okay... But how does God fit with science? Uh, surely science and God are not compatible um, and the key workers are the ones that are making everyone better. I, I wonder whether, so how does God fit with science? Ben and Colin, let's start with you and then maybe we'll move to Nate and Sanjay after that. So Ben and Colin, um, how does God actually fit with scientists? Now you guys are both, you know, both involved with science, both do lots of um, medical things. Um, do you do you think that helps your faith or do you think use that as a stumbling block? And um, Ben, can we start with you for that one? Yeah, of course. I mean, for me, I think it helps. Um, I mean, as, as a scientist and a doctor, I think you, what's um, fascinating for me is how complicated the human body is. And I think the more I've studied it as a doctor, the more I've appreciated how little we understand. And I think coronavirus has just completely highlighted that. You know, it's out the blue. We've suddenly um, had to deal with something that we've never, uh, well, we, we, we didn't know anything about. And I think it's that complexity, that unknown, you know, if you take, for instance, the brain as a human organ, it's absolutely fascinating how uh, it operates. And there's so much we don't know. And I think for me, that's where, um, you know, believing in uh, there being a God, it's about, well, hang on a sec, who created all of this? Did it just happen by chance? And and I find that really hard to believe. Yeah, I did speak about it in my in my small testimony that I've been a scientist for the last 20 years. And I, as, as, as Ben clearly said, that he's, you know, God's creation is amazing. So all I'm trying to do is unravel it, you know, like leaf by leaf taking up, trying to understand this creation and trying to give my explanation to his creation. And at points I'll get stuck and I know that I cannot explain certain phenomenon that I see or I cannot explain certain things. But then I know that's, 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 that's my end. That's God's creation. I need to stop and I need to kind of, kind of, pull back and talk to him and say, God, you know, you want to explain this to me. I think I cannot do it myself. So you want to explain this to me. And that is exactly what happened during the pandemic. We were not able to, we were not able to understand in very simple terms how to take this testing forward. And that's where I stopped and I prayed and I said, God, you know what? I can't do this anymore. You need to explain this to me. 
and help me navigate through your mysteries. Absolutely. So actually, you know, God is using all those uh, those people too, but is helping you do that. So that's amazing. Thanks so yeah. much. Thanks, guys. That's great. Okay. Um, I think that is all we're going to have time for in terms of question and answers. Um, Sanjay and Nate, I hope that's okay if we don't come back to you. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for all the questions that they've had, that we've we've had. It's been really, I've learned loads, uh, actually. Um, uh, so it's been really great to have that. Now, um, as we come to the end of our hour, um, I'm sure that there are many more questions that you would like to have asked or didn't get a chance to ask or didn't quite want to ask. Um, and if you want to know more about anything that we have discussed tonight, um, maybe it's something that you've heard about COVID or it's something that actually Nay said and thought, actually, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. I'd really like to know. OK, so I want to find this God in COVID-19. Um, there are two fantastic books um, that have been recommended to us um, that we would recommend that you read um, during this time if you do want to know more. Um, one is by John Lennox, um, which talks about where is God in COVID-19, um, and the other is by Tim Dennis, and is another a smaller leaflet about all about these topics. Um, if you are Southampton-based, um, please drop us a line on social media um, or by email um, through our church website. We would love to drop you one of those books. During our daily exercise, we will find someone in the church um, who can drop you one of those books. We would love to talk to you more about some of those questions. Um, as a church, we also meet every Sunday morning where we get to look every week at some of these sort of questions and, and meet together. Um, and we'd love to see you. We're currently meeting every Sunday morning um, online, a bit like this, but on Zoom. Um, the link is on the church website, so we'd really love to see you. Again, if you've come along with somebody um, today, it might be that you want to talk to them about some of the things that you um, have heard or from questions that you've had. Um, and it might be that actually, uh, God aside, you are feeling really isolated and lonely in lockdown. Um, 2020 has certainly been a year of loneliness and um, if that is you and you really would like to find a way of connecting to somebody during lockdown um, that there are loads of people in the church that would love to talk to you not just about faith um, but just how you are how can we support you other things that we can do and um, all details of that can also be found on the church website and I'm really excited that, um, that we've been able to talk about some of these topics and I'd urge you to think about some of those questions that Nay asked there are lots of people who, who can't answer those questions and please feel free to come out. Um, this year has been a tough one, um, but there is hope in COVID-19. And we believe that God is with us even in those lowest moments. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if there's any questions that you'd like to hear again, the YouTube uh, link will be available. Um, and we can't wait to see you again soon. Stay safe, have a lovely evening and see you later. <laughs>